Let's talk about how good Lance Armstrong really was and try to answer a question what would happen if he joined professional cycling before advent of EPO or even today. Well, I am quite old man and I might be a bit biased to old school cycling so keep in mind it is just my subjective way of thinking. Let's take a look first at recent Tour de France winners and briefly compare them to Tour de France winners from Lance Armstrong era. Here in upper row we have boys like Chris Froome, Geraint Thomas, Egan Bernal and Tadej Pogacar. Down below we have real villains, Bjarn Ries, Jan Ulrich, Pantani and finally Darth Vader of cycling Lance Armstrong himself. First of all, all athletes in upper row looks like juniors in comparison to gang of four down below. Of course, it doesn't take away anything from them as they are great in terms of performance, work ethics and achievements, but I doubt they could survive realities of cycling back in the 90s. Dealing with teams where you just got one way ticket, dope or loose injecting EPO and overusing performance enhancing drugs in a regular way in secret even before family and sponsors, having to perform blood transfusion in cover somewhere in a hotel room, then ride to the maximum and finally, with cold blood, answer questions at press conference. I just think it would be too much for them from psychological point of view. This kind of stuff required different mindset, turning off moral side of yourself and do what you had to do. Accept dirty rules and play this world tour game together with your crime partners. Back in the late 80s, Lance Armstrong was in top of elite athletes in US winning many triathlon competitions. He was ranked the number one triathlete in the under age of 19 group and became national sprint course triathlon champion in 1989 and 1990. He definitely was talented in endurance sports like running or cycling. In early 90s, when he turned professional with the Motorola cycling team, he collected meaningful trophies like World Road Championship held in Norway. Armstrong was also high ranked in races like Tour du Pont or Liege Baston Liege. He was able to win stages of the Tour de France in both 1993 and 1995, although he withdrew from tours he attempted, admitting he was not ready to compete with the same performance through all stages of Tour de France. But it's known that at this time, top Euro teams were fueled by EPO already. Although there were no effective tests against EPO, most of the accusations were based on hematocrit measure. In case the density of red blood cells exceeded 50%, it was considered supernatural. The thing is that detection rate was poor, as the team doctors were able to accommodate microdosing and schedule to frequency of expected anti-doping controls. Armstrong stated he began doping in late spring of 1995, when he was introduced to infamous Dr. Michael Ferrari by Eddie Merckx. The relationship between Ferrari and Merckx is a bit puzzling, but this is a different story. According to many professional cyclists, EPO was an absolute game changer in endurance sports. The impact of this hormone was quickly noticed by experienced riders in the early 90s. They started to feel kind of performance gap between them and the rest of the peloton. Jonathan Voters, in his book One Way Ticket, recalls a short conversation with Greg LeMond during Classic du Alpe race in 1994, where they both trying to catch up with main group. He asked LeMond, whether he is going to win the race. But Le Mans response was shocking. No way I'm going to win. Racing is different these times. I am just trying to survive. Anyway, we can assume Armstrong was not using EPO till the end of 1995. 
but still was able to compete during one-day races or single stages of Tour de France. Of course, there were other types of performance-enhancing drugs used like testosterone or clenbuterol, but none of them could compare to EPO and direct red blood cell stimulation. EPO was doping standard in Europe years before Armstrong joined Cofidis or US Postal Team. After recovering from testicular cancer, Armstrong focused mainly on Tour de France, and in my opinion, he used doping to align his chances with other dopers like Ries, Pantani, or Ulrich. There was simply no other option to win, and he was not the author of the situation. Of course, in upcoming years, Armstrong with his doctor Michael Ferrari mastered EPO usage with connection program. In 2018, Dr. Dave Martin compared Cadel Evans and Lance Armstrong fitness levels at age 22. He based his work on data from Coyle's University in Texas, where Armstrong was tested five times between the ages of 21 and 28. Lance produced highest VO2 max values in 1993. Based on laboratory testing data, when Cadel and Lance were both 22, for a one-hour time trial, Cadel might have sustained 370 watts, whereas Lance might have been able to maintain 425 watts. Despite of huge difference in power, both raiders had similar power-to-weight ratio at age 22, which was about 6 watts per kilogram. Power data taken from another rider, supposedly clean, Miguel Indurain in 1995, where 500 watts generated by 81 kg body, resulting also in 6 watts per kilogram. Raw numbers definitely say Lance Armstrong had potential long before joining EPO train. Knowing his early achievements, laboratory data and mindset, there is no point believing that in clean cycling he wouldn't be successful. But still, one question remains. Would he be able to win Tour de France so many times without EPO? Personally, I doubt. According to research mentioned in Matt's Randall book, Death of Marco Pantani, EPO was the type of drug which would malform final results, as performance gain might differ amongst athletes. This is because body response to EPO is not the same for everyone. So even most of top riders from Lance era doped, we cannot assume exactly same results without EPO even if they all have trained as hard as they did. Thanks for watching and please leave your thoughts regarding Lance's performance in a comment.